So on this week's show, we have a very special guest, filmmaker Danny Tedesco. His dad, Tommy Tedesco, is the most recorded guitar player in history. He played on some 35,000 recordings throughout the 60s and 70s when he was making music history. In 1995, when his dad was diagnosed with cancer, Danny decided to point a camera at him and record some things about his life for posterity. That turned into an 18-year journey making the documentary film called The Wrecking Crew, which you ought to just see. It's a magnificent movie. And after 18 years of making the film and slogging it around from city to city to raise funds to keep making the film and pay for the rights to the music, there's over 100 songs in the picture. Denny has finally inked a deal for a wide release by Magnolia Pictures. Their ability to bring a great documentary to a wide audience is tremendous, and it's a big deal for Denny and for those of us who have seen the movie throughout this journey. Now, Denny began showing the movie at film festivals and in fundraisers over the last several years, and as the film has taken shape, uh, it's evolved slowly with the addition of new material, new footage, and I've seen the movie five times. And in that time span, I've been fortunate enough to become friends with Denny and his sister Des and his mom Carmi, and they're just terrific. I can't speak highly enough of each one of them. So Pete and I sat down with Denny during the very last pre-distribution screening of the Wrecking Crew film, and here's our conversation. This week's podcast on the Break It Down show, we have filmmaker Denny Tedesco in the house. Wow, that's cool. Yeah, man. I hear he's a really cool guy. I've heard that myself. <laughs> oh, wait, that's me. Yeah. <laughs> I feel uh, like NPR ladies. Yeah, oh, yeah. Let's talk real quiet. Sweaty balls. Sweaty balls. I love that. <laughs> that's awesome. Oh, that's perfect. Oh. Hey, I'm Denny Tedesco. I'm the filmmaker. No, see it? Um, we're, gonna, we're keeping that. Exactly. Too. That's good. Right? Cool jazz. Yeah. All Rock right. and roll. All right. Let's uh, go. Yeah. Let's do it. This is the Break It Down show, and our special guest this week is filmmaker Denny Tedesco. How you doing, man? I'm very cool. Thank it's, you. It's, it's awesome being here today. Thanks, man. The pleasure is ours. This okay. is our last screening, our last public screening of this. Holy shit. Do you uh, feel the weight off your shoulders yet? No. Okay. No, I don't feel I don't think that weight will ever go away. You know, that's why I keep eating. Right. <laughs> Just make sure yeah. it feels like I'm... No, I don't know. You know what? Uh, after 18 years of this film, I know it was coming, but I still there's always feel like there's something behind. You know, I always feel like, oh, what's going to hit me? Well, your dad gave you quite the burden. He said, you know, tell my story. And you said, well, okay. He, he actually, he did. That was the thing. I was like, he didn't understand why I wanted to tell the story. Oh, ah, you know, interesting. You know, I think he he was always, he was more practical than I was. You know, when I was doing like a rock video in the um, 80s, late 80s, I did a, a, I was working on rock videos and I wanted to direct like all of us. We always want to direct and produce or whatever. And I went to him and I said, listen, you got a new album coming out. Let's do a jazz video, you know, because we could play it on VH1 at the time. They had a jazz, um, jazz video part of the side of the right. station. Yep. And he was trying to convince me to do it on uh, some rock, do it on a rock act. You don't want to do it on me. And, and, you know, he's trying to be practical. He knew what, you know, it's jazz doesn't sell, son. <laughs> so, and he's, he's certainly been around the block to know. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. I mean, you know, he was, you know, he, he made more money playing, like you said, more money playing rock and roll than he ever played making jazz. Making right. jazz, yeah. So, but at the time, there was a place for it. You, you know, there was a VH1 and you could yeah. tune on, tune in VH1 and catch Kenny G or Najee or somebody yeah. like that. Yeah, I mean, it's, I learned quick in the business and, and growing up in the business. I didn't really grow up. My dad kept his business at work, you know, so I didn't really understand what the business was until much later. You know, I okay. knew dad just went to work and that was it. He went to work just like all the other dads. Yeah. He didn't, you know, his, the tools in his car was a, a six string acoustic and maybe a 12 string and a banjo and a mandolin electric and a telecaster amp you know that was it but it was just like a anybody else going to work with tools in the, in the trunk yeah instead of the hammer or saw that's what he had did you, you know? find that you got to know your dad better after he was gone by making the movie um i think so i mean you know we had a great relationship my father in a lot of ways i mean we always we were the biggest fans of each other but we were also really critical of each other which was kind of messed up 
Huh. And when I say, you know what I mean, we we could wind each other up pretty well like a father's son. Sure. Um, he knew how to push those buttons. But when he got cancer, I think that all stopped. You know, it was like, okay, put that behind us. Suddenly it creates uh, a sense of what's really important. Yeah. Yeah. And, and actually what's really not important. And what's really not important. You know what yeah. I mean? Yeah. There's certain things. It's funny. It's like when you go away, I always remember living in England in 84. I was living over there for a few months. And I just remember hearing about all this bunch of crap that was going on at home, you know, with family issues or whatever with other people. And I went, wow, that doesn't affect me. It's like, like, uh, you know, it, I would like walked away from it. It had nothing to do with me. Just normal household family just, yeah, crap. Yeah, just, you know, it's like losing your keys. Who cares? <laughs> you know right. I mean? it, but right. it was serious to them, yeah. whatever was going on. And there was stuff. But I couldn't do it. I couldn't deal with it. So it, I kind of like stepped away from it. So that's what I mean. It's like when you find out what's really means something versus what, you know. Yeah. So let's go back to your, your directing rock videos. So you went to... Directing. Did you put a plural on that? <laughs> Video. <laughs> I did. I did. It wasn't. You did a rock video. I no. I worked in rock videos as okay. a technician. I see. And then when I wanted to, you know, I was a grip and I was electrical, and um, you know, I had a place. I lived on Hollywood and Vine. It was a. We had a loft. You lived on Hollywood and I Vine. Literally lived on Hollywood and Vine. I had wow. A, we had a loft in the in behind the Broadway building. And just um, that address gets you laid constantly, does it? Yeah. Sometimes. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> wait, wait, wait. I can say that, yeah, it was good. Yeah. Um, we had a loft, and it was literally, um, it was the worst time in Hollywood, I mean, 80s, to be there. But we were doing a lot of rock videos. We did, like, Robbie Neville's video. We did uh, okay. Ramon's video there. We did a lot of videos there. Robbie Neville's video. Say la vie? Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Oh, yeah. yeah it was that was a good video. It, was a, it won a big award that year. Yeah. It was like, I think, our one of our big, you know, big ones. Uh -huh. But we had fun. We had, you know, we were all young filmmakers. But it was a bad time to be in Hollywood, but there you well, are. You're big, making good videos. You yeah. It was, no, it was, it was when I say bad time to live there. To live there. I mean, it, it was, my, I'm sure my parents were panicked. They were panicked. Yeah. I mean, it was like the worst of, you know, streets there. Yeah. But now it's like, it's Disneyland. It's wonderful. You know, you right. can walk down the streets, wonderful restaurants, wonderful this. Cleaned yeah. up and gentrified. Oh, very much. I mean, I remember one time going, um, I lived at, it was at a dead end alleyway. And the cool part was, I always remember this, was it was an October night going to the bar across the street. When I say walked at the end of the alleyway and I walk out on Divine across the street, there was a bar called the Firefly. And was there since the 30s or 40s. Well, it got out of hand, this place, because the bartenders, if they weren't dealing in coke or other drugs, they were lighting the bar on fire. <laughs> it was literally, they would put, like, lighter fluid in the bar well. When do we get to the spot where it's, it's, it it's would, not cool to live there? Exactly. <laughs> <laughs> and so would, far, you get yeah, laid a lot, yeah, yeah. and you got You're bartenders good point. lighting the bar on fire. And he would basically, this guy would go, the the crowd would go, you know, he would literally light the one end of the bar and went, you know, all the way down. down was, the that was called the Firefly, this place. Okay. Uh, um, you know, it got closed down. I, finally, the fire department put an end to that. They don't like open flames uncontrolled. On, I guess it's not. I think uh, they didn't name the place the Fire Crotch in yeah. the 1930s. That's why Coyote is so great. Do you remember David and David? There was a group called David and David. I don't recall that. Uh, it's in the 80s. They did a song called The Firefly. And it was about that place? Yeah. Okay. Nice. Look it up, folks. It's fun. Yeah. David and David. Where it's basically is telling a story about living there is like, which is true. It's like everybody thinks they're somebody. Sure. You know, we all think we're somebody in that bar. Uh huh. You know, what I was saying is about was living there was really cool. But I remember going home one day and, um, at the end of the alleyway, I had my steps went up right to the door and there's a, you know, a bum, you know, a homeless guy. He's old and he's just taking a, you know, a dump on off off the, the side, off the side of the stairs. I'm saying, thank you. Okay. That's good. All right. And I was, I was meaning to redecorate that yeah. spot. <laughs> yeah. So I walked up to him and I said, hello. He said, hello. And hello. he starts, he starts going. He, he, he starts, starts talking. into his spiel. Yeah. But his spiel was like, this guy's, oh my God, this guy's got something to say. He starts talking about, um, the Queen of England and, you know, and uh, the King of England that, you know, stepped down in the thirties and da 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 da. And he starts going off on, 
Meanwhile, uh, his ass is hanging yeah, off exactly. of the porch. <laughs> he's got exactly. a deuce dripping out of him. He, and then he starts going off on, he's talking about Castro, how Castro, uh, you know, his daughter went to Hollywood High School and this and that. And now I'm thinking the guy's nuts. He, yeah. And Castro was an extra in some movies. And then I'm wondering, it's like, maybe he's right. Yeah. I mean, yeah. there was some stuff that and it came up later that what he said was actually wasn't that far off. Wow. Right. And I'm like, <laughs> wow. So... Wow. So he moved he moved in, by the way. We became roommates now. (laughs) (laughs) You gave him a more permanent place. Well, he was better than my other roommate. (laughs) So Wow. So uh as much as I really want to delve further into that topic. The uh Yeah, what are we talking about? Well, we were talking Mm -hmm. about you making music videos. Oh, right, right, right. So basically it was gripping and that was our way of getting in in the eighties, what was really interesting in Hollywood and in the industry. When MTV came along, it gave us the technicians and the filmmakers an opportunity to do something that wasn't to do around. Work. Yeah. Right. You know, dancers were my God, dancers were getting jobs. You right. know, there were no dancers at that point. You know, don't forget we didn't have those shows like um Shindig and all those other shows in the sixties were a lot of dancers. Right. So dancers being hired, I'm getting hired for as grips, you know, we're all getting hired as whatever. Friends are DPs and stuff. Yeah. You know, so the guys that were doing commercials wouldn't be doing this stuff because it was lower budget. It's almost like the Wrecking Crew in a lot of ways. They weren't doing, you know, so they wouldn't do that stuff. It was, you know, lower budget. It was beneath their occupational station. So well, they didn't need to do it. Yeah. Why work? You know, we were right. working. I remember doing flat fees and it would be ridiculous, stupid things. Wow. I remember July 3rd doing a DeBarge video. I can remember the day because it was July 3rd and came home on July 4th, right. the same wow. time I went in. And it was a DeBarge video. I always you remember that. You 24 hours on it, yeah. essentially. Yeah, basically, yeah. What was this? What was the song? Oh, God knows. Who okay. remembers? You know, it was one of those things. So you, those days were... It, you, you I want to go back and watch that video, though, and see Jerry Curls and, like, <laughs> yeah. Duster yeah. Jackets and cr- and crazy shit and yeah. go, Danny worked 24 hours on this video. Yeah, that's when I get cringe when I see... It's like Janet Jackson. When I see um, Janet Jackson, I worked on as a grip, and I remember uh, it was Nasty Boys. Oh, okay. Okay. And it was yeah, downtown, crazy. another light, a night shoot. And I tend to have a horrible reputation of being clumsy. Uh-huh. So... And if I remember some bum, another homeless guy, seems like they're always around me, yeah. but somebody ran, basically fell into the light stands and knocked everything over and they thought it was me. Right. <laughs> Just, they heard a big crash, thought, oh God, where's Denny? Where's Denny? Wow. Where's the lights? Was, well, me. it could have been worse. It could have been, you know, like a bum shat on the craft services table and then somebody said, where's Danny? Yeah, exactly. <laughs> make- <laughs> At least it's I'm known for yeah. clumsiness, not, yeah. not shat Pooing, all, over pooing all over the food. Yeah. So... <laughs> Okay, what? So what, basically, what I was doing, I was doing those videos. I was a grip, you know, but I didn't. I was trying to write. I really. I started off as a decorator. I was in art department before that. My first film was Eating Raul, which was sure. Do I was you remember a, that? Yeah. Man, I loved that movie. Did you? That was in. For those who don't know, was this very dark? It was really dark, dark comedy. Yeah, dark comedy. You know. And I didn't even know what dark comedy was at the point. I was just out of there high were, school. There were laughs and killing. Yeah, yeah. exactly. And the story for also the, titties. Yes, yeah. that was my first job with titties. Um, yeah, I was a decorator. I didn't know what a decorator did. Basically, I got on that job because I was on a school project for AFI, working free, uh-huh. you know, as a grip. And this, um, unfortunately, at the time. Um, now, unfortunately, that's the way it was. We were all smoking pot. So the art director was checking me out, and he thought, wow, he's really intense. He's really focused. I wasn't focused. I had nothing else. I couldn't do anything else. <laughs> you were just you staring. Were high. I was staring into space, you know. But he. He's you really know, focused. His so eyes are very red. God. Yeah. He just works all that the time. He's laser focused. <laughs> he's yeah. laser eyes. Laser. And he ended up going. He recommended me to another, to this film called Eden Raul. He was a production designer. Uh-huh. And I didn't know what a uh, set decorator was, but I pretended. But you said, fuck it, I'll do it. Yeah. I'll do it. And the woman, the producer said, when I went in, she says, it pays $200 to 250 a week. I thought, awesome. Yeah, <laughs> yeah I'll really do She's that. making excuses. I'm going like, yeah, cool. Yeah. So Perfect when I went for the redo, and the, or, you know, went back to get the job, she says, so how much do you want? I said, can I get 250 She said, yeah. I went, oh, my God, I'm rich. This is awesome. And I, and 
you know, 250 bucks a week and it was good. You know, it was 1981, whatever it was. It yeah. was good. But I also was working 18, 20 hours a day and I loved it. Yeah. yeah. Because yeah. it was your first real job. and Man, those sets too. I mean... Okay, so eating it all, right. it's been many years since I've seen that movie. Right. Why those those sets look so good is it, for those who don't know it, it was a it was about this retro couple who uh-huh. basically feel like they live in the fifties, right? And he's a wine connoisseur, she's a nurse, but they get stuck in this building of swingers, and these swingers uh, basically happen to come in and attack her, and all of a sudden. Paul Bartel, who's a director and the actor, comes in and sees that his wife's being attacked and he takes a frying pan and hits him and, and he kills hits him. Raul over the head. No, hits the swinger. Okay. Kills the swinger. So at that point, they go, Oh my God, we just killed someone. And they look through his wallet and realize he's a degenerate. He's yeah. a swinger, but he's got money. Nice. No one will miss this guy. So they keep the money and they want to open up Paul and, um, Paul and Mary's cafe. I can't remember what it was called. So they decided to go on this murder spree, and they would convince swingers to come. And he, Raul was the local, the, was the handyman, this Mexican handyman, and you know, handsome, gorgeous, you know, guy who worked in the building. And he figures out what they're doing, and they become, you know, whatever they work together. And long story short, he's in on the take. He's in on the take, and then in the end, well, you know what? Raul tried to uh, double cross him, so, so he's Raul's go. dead. And at the end, when he's, they're making uh, this wonderful meal for their uh, the banker who's giving them the money for the uh, the cafe, he says, "What is this? It, feel, it tastes wonderful. What is this?" And they say, "Well, it's a little Latin, little you know, Mexican. Really, it's really good." So basically, they cooked Raul. Yeah, up. very dark. Dark. It was dark. It was my first I exposure was actually, to dark comedy. Well, I, I was the bodies in the bag, by the way. Oh, were you? Yeah, uh, uncredited. Yeah. Uh, I wasn't credited for the bodies in bag. I am still a little upset about that. Do yeah. you get scale for that kind of work? No, just just hot and sweaty. This was just, a you already making two fifty a week. Get yeah. in the bag. The greatest thing was all right. So one of these things we did was we put in. There was like a, it was called what was it? The Hollywood Press or something. It was one of those nasty magazines, you know, free magazines. Yeah, you know, like, alternative uh, news weekly or whatever. Not even. I mean, it was just nasty, hardcore. This, don't forget, this is way before internet. This right. is hardcore porn stuff. Where, I missed out on this magazine. I know. Okay, I got copies. I'll oh, give right. it to you. Yeah. Cool. Um, so, <laughs> I, the art director and the set decorator, um, it was just a three-man art department. We decided to put an ad in the paper because they put an ad in the paper, right? Right. To get as a prop, it was cheaper for them to put an ad in the paper looking for couples da, 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 or people to swing with this couple and they had Paul and Mary and a whatever. Yeah, it was like an ad to pull and swing. It was yeah. a photo. So it was a fake ad but it wasn't fake because they actually it was cheaper to put it in this. So they had a wow. post box so wondering if anybody was going to send in you know no one ever sent anything in. But what we did was one late night we took our own picture and wrote our own letter and sent it into the mailbox. And so they... <laughs> for the, the film produ- you were working on. Right, and the film we're working on. So all of a sudden, the, the producers, or, you know, the producers hey, go... Hey, we got oh, something. We got something. Oh, my God. And they sat around at lunchtime reading our letter. And, and we were going, everybody had all kinds of thoughts of who, they, what kind of person this was. Right. And, wow. And That's we, awesome. we, we told them at the rap party. So... But they went through the whole thing. But that was the only response that you guys yeah, got, yeah. really. Yeah. Well, I guess it wasn't that. Ex- yeah. What can I, I say? I don't know. Well, I I don't know. Yeah. That was I, my, I'd say bad, badly written copy. I guess so. But you know, we did okay. Because you know, I made a film called Premonitions. It was a terrific experience, and one of the great things that happened was uh, it was low, low, low budget. We were going to shoot the whole thing in nine days, and we had. Denny has no idea what you're talking about. A couple right no, 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 no. He's going to go this he, fast. Yeah. Man, I go 18 years to make my movies. <laughs> right. Yeah. And exactly. we're doing it in nine and, and we're doing it in nine days. What are you guys so crazy? That's we overnight. Had, <laughs> we had a couple of scenes that involved nudity and it wasn't gratuitous. Yes, it was. <laughs> exactly. And uh we, only gratuitous if if you took your pants down, right? That's true. That's true. Okay. I down I was saying off. Right. Down's okay. Off, not so much. But the thing that we did when we were casting it was we, you know, we put an ad on casting.com and we disclosed everything 
Like, we're going to pay you if the movie makes money. So you're you're getting paid scale on contingency. And you will get a nudity bonus and we'll close the set. But there are two days where there are gonna be where there's gonna be nudity. Mm-hmm. So to me, what that sounds like is we're not paying you. And you're gonna have to take your clothes off for like a hundred bucks. Right. So we is that what I'm getting tonight? Because why did you ask me to take my pants off just now? That was that was just for fun. Oh, so, so I'm not was, getting paid. Drink, <laughs> drink your beer. Drink your beer. <laughs> right. Just keep keep drinking. Honestly, so, folks, I'm here with my Bud Light La Maria. <laughs> so the uh, the uh, ad went up on a Sunday night, and I remember the director uh, Sean Sergosi and I were on the phone on Sunday night, and we we're thinking, okay, I'm going to hit the submit button. And nobody's going to reply to this. Right. This is going to be terrible, you know. But we wanted to be honest, so we disclosed everything. And we hit the send button. And then we both went to sleep. And he called me the next day at 6.15 in the morning. So this is recent. This is uh, nine years ago. Still. Yeah. He called me and he said, hey, man, uh, we got responses. And I said, what? And he said, yeah, we got responses. And I don't remember the exact number. But it was like 160. Oh, my God. And I looked at that page of 160 actresses who were willing to work under these circumstances. Long hours, feature in nine days, no money up front except for a nudity bonus. And there's, it's likely that there's full frontal. 160. <laughs> and as I scrolled through these 160 actresses, there were maybe two where I went, not that one. That's right. not bad. That's yeah. That's a lot of quality. Yeah. So there's a... There's a market in nudity. There's a market. Mm. I've heard that. I need to work on this. Maybe I should have done my film. All nude. Oh, no. Well, God that's... help us. No. Yeah. <laughs> no. There's nothing against elderly nudity, but I just... No, oh, I, I thought know. you meant you. Like running around like, I'm making a film. No, I'm yeah. not wearing clothes. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I've got a dickie on. Okay. Boy, did we digress. Yes. Let's get back to your movie. What was my movie? You're you're oh, yeah. you've been at it for 18 years, and right. the Wrecking Crew has gone from. All right, so Wrecking Crew is the story of the Los Angeles session musicians that were doing all the recordings for the Beach Boys, Sinatra, um, Mamas and Papas, the Birds, Johnny Rivers, Elvis when he was in L.A. Um, the Association, Association, the Monkeys, Monkeys, Partridge Family, everybody, yeah. everybody. everybody. Yeah. Anything that was done in L.A. at the time usually had session musicians on there. The Beach. Did you say the Beach Boys? Yeah, the yeah. Beach Boys. Because that's yeah. the big, big, big one for the big me. One. And Phil Spector's Wall of Sound was all the same guys. Yeah. And the Beach Boys, what happened was they were doing their own albums at the beginning. And then... And taking too long. Well, you know what? What happened is Brian... Oh, well, actually, Brian hooked up with uh, Jan, Barry, okay. yeah. and Jan and Dean. And they did Brian's song, Sur- um, Surf City. I think, right. right? And then uh, I could be wrong. I'll get, we'll get letters. Yeah. Do they still do letters? Whatever. I don't think we'll get any, emails. We'll get emails, yeah. Um, and then what, send them. The first one's going to come from my wife because she's a huge fan of Jan and Dean. Oh, there you go. So, so what happened was then Jan, Brian went to visit the recording and saw, you know, his song being done with all these studio musicians. And Jan said, Brian, you could do this. I mean, just, you just do it. So instead of your brothers and your cousin, you know, just to have them do it. So that's where it started. And Hal and Ray Pullman were the first to start doing, you know, bass and drums with them. And then sooner or later, the whole band was replaced, you know, to have studio musicians. Yeah. And it made sense because Brian was writing some stuff that maybe, even if the guys could play it, even if the Beach Boys could have played it, they they wouldn't have it given them the reach. Res- well, they, yeah, it was a reach, but I don't think they would have given them the respect that... Right. If you're your season to or allow paid, his artistic to, exactly, to I think the, you know it's like and I said to someone the other day, it's like you could be God on the outside, but you go home, you're just dad, or right. you're just being a, right. you're just a piece of crap, my asshole little yeah. brother. Or yeah, whatever. you know what I mean. And it's like so. I think that's why it worked out. So these guys were, and boy, did it work out because we ended up with things like Pet, Pet Sounds. Sounds. Yeah. yeah, I mean, Pet Sounds is is inspired other great bands to be greater. Like the Beatles. Yeah. Like yeah. the Stones. You know, right. they're all like, we want to make that album. Yeah. Yeah. So they pushed it, you know, and these guys who are basically going, in those days, what people don't understand, there was only maybe in the mono days, there was only one track. Um, 
you know, you went into a studio in 1960, my father's 30 years old, Hal's 31, 32. They're all seasoned studio musicians. Right. Well, the groups that they're playing with are maybe 18, 19. So the record companies are going, listen, we like your stuff. What we're going to do is you sing the backgrounds and we'll get the studio musicians to play it. And the reason was because they didn't have the money. They didn't want to spend time and the money. It to, was the math. The, yeah. They you wanted, know, we could stick you guys in there and and let you fuddle around with it for eight. And cost hours us a lot of money. And come out with one song yeah. that might be okay. Right. And or, the, we can get it done. Exactly. Exactly. And that's what they did is they put these guys in there. Glenn Campbell was one of the guys. Leon Russell was another one of the studio musicians. Yep. And they would go in and knock out three or four songs in three hours. That's what they were allowed to do. And they went, that's how they did it. And then uh, sooner or later, they just kept moving. Then they became popular. They became the guys. Sure. So as you documented this, this film came from your your dad. Right, my when dad he got sick. Right, dad was sick in '96, and I thought, you know, I don't want this to be my biggest regret in life is not jumping on the story. I knew, you know, Tommy Tedesco was my dad. He was a guitar player. I grew up with it, but I didn't, you know, you know, it's been 30 years since he was doing the rock and roll stuff. But right. you know, at 66, you know, I want his story to be told. And I started it, and I put him and Hal Blaine and Carol Kay, the only woman in the group as a bass player, and Plaz Johnson a round table. I just started filming, and I was shooting film at the time, sixteen millimeter. Terrific personalities too. Yeah, they way. all, and that's the thing with musicians are. Musicians are like I like the I call it the round table without instrument. I call it the quartet without instruments. Yeah, because they will one up on each other they're uh -huh. like you know what i mean they're musicians like the banter or play against each other and they listen and, and come back with a zinger right boom and they set each other up yes and they do things like you know they, they'll, they'll they'll collaborate right in front of you yeah and one could be telling the story and then let the other one finish right yeah, yeah they're too in sync to not do that they exactly to, yes and so that was kind of cool and i would sit there and i would throw it i knew i had two cameras going on the round table and i had i Based it on Broadway, Danny Rose and Diner, oh, two okay. of my favorite movies, sure. where people just, imp you know, they you know, they just, you know, back and forth, overlap and you know, right. tease each other, and all I had to do was just ask a few questions, set it up, and they go off, right? And, Light the fuse, yeah, and that's it. And then uh, went on. Dad passed Hal away Blaine a year is later. Hilarious, yeah. How's Your dad is hilarious. Yeah. They loved each other and teased each other. Yeah. And that went on to, you know, he passed away and I kept going trying to get this, this film out. No one would ever, I never had the film. Right. Because, you know, I kept filming, but, and, you know, you need money to edit. And I just kept spending money on filming. And finally in 2006, we decided, let's go for it. Cause this is 10 years later. We got to make a film. 2008, we came out with the film and festivals did very well, but unfortunately, the music, there was so much music. Everybody said, you'll never be able to pay for this. Right. And um, there was so many uh, negative, like, no, it ain't, it's not going to happen. Yeah, yeah. It just can't fly. It just, yeah. It was like, you know what? I just felt like I had to keep going. What am I going to do? Quit? I had crossed the line. Yeah. Yeah. You know, once I got into the film festivals and did very well, and, you know, Elvis Costello's showing up and Peter Frampton showing up at screenings. You know, I must be doing something right. They you like must. it. And they not just showed up at screenings, but they liked it. And yeah. They left testimonials. Yeah. And, and that was the thing. It was like, I got realized, oh my God, you know, this is real. This right? is real. And, you know, yeah, I made a, we made a great film, but it's the music that, again, it's the characters. Those guys are the, we got lucky. Well, the music provides a backdrop that we can all relate to. Yes. Exactly. That's what it is. Well, we, that is like, I've always said that 50% of the film is the music, meaning like you can walk in there and you will know what the film's about as soon as you hear one, you know, boots were made for walking or good vibrations or be my right. baby. It, it makes you, it, it takes those emotional responses you get from those songs yeah. and it makes you part of that movie. Exactly. You feel it. Exactly. It's like what maybe Partridge family is for us right. is not the same thing as for Maybe my older brother because he's 10 years older than me or someone that's in their 60s because that's not their song, but Good Vibrations is their song. Right. right. Yeah. You know, so every song has a bookmark in someone's life. Right. Even if it is their same song, 
we have a bookmark. I, I, you know what? I remember riding to school on my bike with that. You know, you remember making out with that girl or, that, or something. You know, yeah. everything brings something different. And you're talking about positive memories too. You don't have a lot of negative songs in the movie. No it's positive songs, no. and so you're going to have you're going to draw out these positive emotions from the viewers as they hear it. And think, yeah. oh man, that's right. Which instantly makes you like the guy. Oh, these guys made the music. And it just, it takes that suspension of, of that belief that you have to have and you've given it to them by yeah. saying, this is your music. That's an interesting thing about positive music when you think about, I can't imagine even a negative music, which was really an interesting, you went there and you're just thinking, what? You it's know. not like this is a documentary about Morrissey songs. Yeah. <laughs> you know? Yeah. It, this, there's no, this, actually, this my, guy is actually you said that a friend of, of mine Morrissey actually songs. did that. Yeah. He did a, he did a, yeah, he went on tour with him. It was so sad because in the end, Morrissey wouldn't let him release it. Wow. Which is such a dick move. That uh, is a dick move. Come on. You know, yeah. you'd spend all this time months and I hate that. Yeah, that yeah. sucks. So, um, well, here's what I'm going to say because I've been, I'm going to tell the story about how uh, whenever I happen to be around and, you know, I, 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 I I make myself a hanger on around you as much as I can. Whenever you come to town, I go, "Hey, Denny, I'm gonna do is pop that you? by and see what you did." <laughs> so you hanging out? Wow. The uh, and 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 tonight, one of the ladies, one of the hot chicks who was hanging out with your with your sister, asked, "Well, how do you know the Tedescos?" And here's how I know the Tedescos. Years and years ago, I was probably I don't know, 17 or 18 years old, playing the drums. And I met this guy. His name was Bill. He was a windsurfer. He was just like an old character. You know, he would windsurf with a cowboy hat on or something. And he was just a cool dude. So he said, uh, yeah, man, so you play the drums, huh? And I said, yeah. And he goes, uh, what do you think about Hal Blaine? And I said, who? And he said, you ought to be ashamed of yourself. Oh, that's so funny. You fucking whippersnapper. <laughs> and he gave me a copy of the book. And he wow. said, read this. And I said, oh, huh. And he went, I'm not kidding. Take this home and read it. So I took it home and I started reading it. And I stayed up for three days and just read the book. And I'd nod off and I'd wake up. This was, you know, I was young and yeah. didn't have a job or anything. So I, was, I just read that book all the way through and I was mesmerized. So fast forward many years later. And I was in the, uh, it was probably around 2011 maybe. 2010, 2011. I was getting my hair cut, and I was sitting there in the uh, in the place. And next to me, there was some uh, conversation going on with somebody who kept saying the Wrecking Crew. And so I just, you know, like the the guy who was it was your sister, and the guy who was cutting her hair, you know, turned around to go get shampoo or something, left your sister there for a second. So I said, I don't want to butt in or anything, but I do because yeah. you're talking about the Wrecking Crew. And she said to me, "Oh, it's not what you're thinking of. You're <laughs> thinking of the wrestlers." And I was like, "I don't know anything about wrestlers, but I'm talking yeah. about Hal Blaine and Tommy Tedesco." And she went. Holy shit, you know who the Wrecking Crew is. And I said, yeah, I know who the Wrecking Crew is. Come on, who doesn't? Well, that's and funny. And she said, no, Tommy Tedesco is my dad. I remember that. And she, she called home and said, I met a guy that I for the barbers. <laughs> it's like, <laughs> yeah. It's so funny. So she said, well, you know what? You ought to meet my brother because he's making the fan. She told me about the film and how right. you had kind of been underway. And so she gave me her email address. All right. And I sent you an email. And I said, hey. I think the subject line was, fuck, really? <laughs> You're I making thought, a movie. And I thought, oh, God, I know that subject line. Yeah. <laughs> so, uh, yeah, and you replied like, yeah, I'll let you know when I'm coming up there. And then uh, eventually uh, there was a screening in Santa Cruz. Right. And so, you know, in addition to wanting to see the movie, we'll take any excuse to go to Santa Cruz. And uh, I took so my we, wife and my son down I there. forgot about that one. Yeah. God, that's so long ago. So I don't know when that was, but that was the first time I saw the film. It was Don Randy with was with me, right? Yes, he was. It was in that little studio. Yeah, that, yes, yeah, it was. Yeah, it was in the. It was at UC Santa Cruz, and it was a little. Was it UC Santa Cruz? Was yeah, it? I think so. I can't remember. I um, keep making noise on this table. That's right. Uh, not um, me. Um, yeah, I, basically, what happened at that point was that was the only when everybody kept saying, "You're never going to get this film out." Yeah. The only thing I could do was beg for money and you know 
I had to come up with a way of donating money. I wanted to get sponsors involved. And someone said, well, why don't you get a fiscal sponsor? What do you mean? I said, someone that will take the money as a donation nonprofit. They'll take the money and they'll give you the money. So then I had to think, all right, how's that going to work? So then I went doing song dedications. And that started something where people dedicate a song for $1,000. You get your name up on the wall. Basically, you put it up on the website and the DVD, it'll be all there. And um, that's what we end up doing. So then donation, I created levels of donations. You know, you're a groupie if you're under 100. You're a roadie if you're over 100. <laughs> uh, I can't remember. Uh, 5,000, You, I mean, it went from uh, 300. I can't remember what you were. 500, you were this. And executive producer, you know, at 50,000. So, wow. And but, I saw that uh, Herb Albert and Jerry Moss. Yeah. Were yeah. executive producers. Yeah, well. they bought in. They bought. Well, yeah, and they didn't even know. I had actually called them recently. And said, "You guys okay if I put me your names up? If it helps you, go for it." So great, great. Which is really cool. It is that cool. is really cool. It's you know, cool. because they don't usually do that. Even though Herb's known for giving his money to, but they don't give money to the uh, f- films or anything like that. Yeah, his foundation. You know, and people would say, "Well, why doesn't so and so give you money?" Just because they're in my film doesn't mean they. You know, they might have the money, but they don't know that the struggle is. Sure. They're just my interviewers. You yeah. know, or my interviewees. Interviewees, or you know, yeah. You know, you can't go they back. They were kind and, enough to be the subject. Exactly. Matter. So I can't go back to Sharon and say, hey, Sharon, do you mind giving me 10 grand? You know, it's yeah. kind of like, you know, kind of, it's a, it's an odd, it's, that's why it's taking me so long. Maybe because I didn't have the balls to go after it sometimes, yeah. but I'm, the, I'm glad the way it went. How do you get Cher? Cher was an interesting situation. Cher, I worked with in, in rock videos, actually. In 1988, I worked with her in one of her, you know, reincarnations. Right. And we did a video, and I remember standing next to her and talking to her. I said, you know, Cher, my dad worked with you in the with the Spectre day. She goes, you know, she's very businesslike. She's very straight, you know, very... You know, and very smart, very smart, and doesn't mess up. You know, there's nothing about Cher that's um, soft. When I, you know, I mean, it's like very business down to earth, down to earth. When I, you know, and she said, "Who's your dad?" You know, just like very. I said, "Tommy Tedesco," and she went, "Tommy and Billy and you know Hal," and went off on it. Yeah, so I softened her up. Softened her up. So this is before I was doing a video, so I knew there was a chance that Cher would react if she was given that chance. And so then I went to, um, uh, years later, I knew her agent and I talked to her and I said, would you ask Cher if she would do this? Now, I think her agent only asked because it was us, my wife and I. Right. Not because, you know, and I don't think she ever thought Cher would say yes, but Cher did say yes. And when she called back, she said, Cher said yes. <laughs> you could hear it in her voice like, Oh my gosh, she said yes. But I knew there was a chance because no one knew this part of Cher. This is not Cher, the singer, the star of the The, 70s, 80s. Huge. This is Cher as a backup singer for the Ronettes when she's 16 and she's really not supposed to be there because she's Sonny's girlfriend, you know. Right. right. Can you imagine? Underage? Yeah. Yeah. Sonny, this, you know. Hell, only R. Kelly gets away with that nowadays. Yeah. Yeah. Just barely. Barely. And so, you know, that. Kind of like, so I knew, and so when I went in and was able to, they finally called and said, you can come in at this point. She was doing a bunch of press and I, I had 10 minutes, you know, basically it was fit in between like Barbara Walters and People Magazine or something in one day. Wow. She killed in those 10 minutes. Then. She killed in those yeah, 10 minutes. Yeah, absolutely. Because, man, she nailed got it. quite a bit of footage. Nailed it. Nailed it. I mean, I was, I had 10 minutes, one roll of film. And um, I remember her uh, assistant going, all right, that's enough. And I just ignored and just kept asking questions. And, you know. Wow. But it was good. So share was easy. You know, the hard one was like getting Brian Wilson, getting him there and finally getting Brian after eight years, you know. It took you eight years to get Brian Wilson. Yeah. Yeah. You, know, you just, you don't know who you call. Or you call, you get shot down. You yeah. know, the people that shot me down, which I'm, grateful now that they didn't they said no but upset at the time was um tom petty's people bonnie Raitt. um you know i was trying to get their inf- their their max weinberg these people know who these people were they could have said something yeah but and that's why i went for them but they didn't you know they said nope nope 
that were nothing to say. I said, okay, that's fine. In the end, I'm glad. Yeah. Because they don't fit in the film. You know, that's one thing I like about the film. I didn't have to go outside. You know, the people that are talking about these people knew these people. Everybody does fit. Yeah. I mean, you can tell I have tell Dick that- Clark in there. And the only reason Dick Clark was in there, when my dad passed away, Dick Clark did a... um uh, obituary in the, on the, his radio show. Oh, right. Okay. Uh-huh. So I thought, oh, you know, so I thanked Dick Clark. I sent him a letter thanking him. And by the way, I have this, you know, video movie I'm trying to do. Would you be interested in, you know, being interviewed? And he wrote a nice letter back, typed and said, you know, unfortunately, I really don't know any of these guys. I never met them in person. I really wouldn't have much to say about blah, blah, blah. They're wonderful people. Good luck. And then at the bottom of the page, he wrote in, Give me a call. I just looked at your little, your 10 minute piece or 14 minute piece and you could talk me through it. Great. Cause I didn't need Dick Clark to know them. I needed Dick Clark to be the Dick spokesperson Clark. for the American exactly. yeah. music exactly. consumer. And that's what he was. I yeah. mean, if anybody knew that, if anybody knows American music, who knows American music better than the creator of American bands? Yeah. So for him to, to uh, say what he said, it was perfect yeah. because he didn't have to. I didn't speak need to. From I, I wasn't asking him to talk about. I needed more of a historical point of view, right? right. And, and he that's was what I got. sort of speaking for the audience. Yeah, exactly. So when you got Dick Clark, that I mean, I know you you went into this project to record your dad for posterity. You just happened to get a lot of people for posterity. Well, though. I knew it wasn't. I knew I had to get. You know, I knew I needed. You know, I tried to get Herb for years, Herb Alper for years, never could get to him. Yeah. And then finally when I get to Lou Adler, someone got me to Lou, and Lou said, why don't I try to get Herb with me? I said, well, I've been trying yeah. to get Herb forever. I just, well, Herb told me about this. Oh, great. He told you about it. Why didn't he call me? Yeah. <laughs> I was like, like oh, come on. So so that worked out, the two of them together. And then, like I said, Brian was Jimmy Webb. Jimmy was great. Jimmy was the best interview. Because he was like so articulate. Mm-hmm. Oh man, he's you put his tape, sixty minute tape into a uh, edit bin or edit bay, and just pick a number between yeah. zero and sixty. It, it e- can be in there. That's how good it is. Every second. Every second. Yeah, he's terrific. You know, I really enjoyed Carol Kay too. Mm-hmm. Man, you have to enjoy her. Yeah, she's so unique and and compelling. You and know? then the the point that Nancy Sinatra made too about when she was. You know, it's okay if I do with these boots are made for walking. It's not it's not weird and creepy and abusive. Right. Those, but Lee but Lee Hazelwood was your who wrote it, right. did it for himself. Yeah. yeah. And that was that was not gonna go over the same way. No. There was not the least bit cute. And the way that you cut from her saying that to the video. Oh yeah. Oh right. Oh man. It's very good. That was great. Yeah. You know that we're all into the historical markers in our own emotion about the music, but the, com- the compelling characters in this film are really what does it. Mm. And I, like I said, the first time I watched the movie was in Santa Cruz. That was many years ago. And I've seen the film as Bro. it evolved yeah. the, in, in, you know, and I, and I really saw it from polished to very polished. Yeah. So I didn't see. see yeah. When you think it was, when I always thought it was finished and then it got, you know, something else happened. I was like, Oh, I could do that. I right. could put Al Jardine and Peter Tork in because we did the Mill Valley Film Festival. They played at the party afterwards. So I did wow. quickly did an interview with those two. And so when the time wow. when I had to I'm go in. you did. Yeah. So it helped me. Things came up. But, you know, my editor also said to me, you got to stop interviewing people because we can't put everybody in. You know, she was right. You can't do all these interviews and expect five seconds, ten seconds and fall in love with a character. Right. So I said, well, that's why God gave us DVDs, you know, and yeah. I'm hoping that, you know, God doesn't take them away. Yeah. You know. Yes, I want the Wrecking Crew box set. Yeah. With I mean, all you, the, I mean, how many hours of footage do you have? Oh, hundreds. I don't even know. Hundreds. I don't even, I've never counted. You I can don't, make a whole new movie out of what you have. Shut up. <laughs> just, <laughs> yeah, right. Hey, just, what are you doing hey, for the next 18 years? Put the years. gun down. <laughs> <laughs> I was just But yeah, kidding. I mean, really, for those of oh, us yeah. who, who I mean, you know, have fallen in love with the story and the characters, you, you know, but the thing is, a lot any, for the DVDs. I'm hoping that, you know, somewhere down the line, people will, it'll go in schools, whatever. Look these people up. Hear a story. Yeah. Because it relates to today. How... 
they related to their work. You know, the, my two favorite lines in the movie, which have nothing to do with music. When I asked Bones how, I said, Bones, who was a great, he was a great engineer, but and a great producer. And he did all the mamas and papas stuff as an engineer. And then he produced uh, Tom Waits and he produced uh, uh, Fit Dimension and so much stuff. I said, what is it like when you're at the top of the world? You're the A team. You are the guys. And then you're not. How does that affect you? And he says, it's like athletes. You got your minor leagues, you got your majors, and you got your, you know, ramp down. It's not about staying at the top. It's taking that ramp down as long as possible. And then one of the interviews I did with Mark Marin, that interview I did, we talked about it. And he gave me the word that made sense to me is relevant. We all want to be relevant. Yeah. And it's true. You know, we're all in that situation. We want to be relevant. That's why we, I'm doing the movie. That's why you're doing the podcast. Right. There's something about why do we want to do it? I think we want to be relevant. We sure. want to give something. We want to feel something. And, and, it, and we want it to matter. Yeah, absolutely. And so in your later years, these guys just, you know, my dad, when he was 60 years old, he was playing his guitar better than any time he ever played. But he wasn't working that much. He wow. Get, you know, he get called for like, I think the last movies he did, Schindler's List and um, uh, Godfather 3, it's, which is unfortunate. Amazing. It was Godfather 3. Right? Yeah. <laughs> we all Three had uh, high expectations on Godfather 3. <laughs> Damn it all. Yeah, now Sofia Coppola I like Sofia Coppola. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> but, you know, the, when you mention that, it's... It's a matter of the the players and their individual journeys, you know, and they all were different. But your dad, when he was 60, he was still, he wasn't getting called to work as much, but guitar players all over the world yeah. still loved your dad yeah. and wanted to hear And he from loved, him. And listen, he loved doing what he did. He loved doing the seminars. He loved, you know, he loved playing. He loved playing live when he could. But when the stroke happened, though, he had a stroke two years later, and that yeah. basically ended his career. Right. You know, and and like at the end of the film, I say, you know, and he said to me just a few months before he passed, he said, you know, the stroke came at the right time of his life. Yeah. He had an excuse why he can't play. Right. Versus, well, I'm just not busy. You know, right. And right. I can't play because I can't. Because nobody's know. calling me. Yeah, exactly. That's worse than having a, a stroke is better. Right. You know, um, he had no control over it. And, wow. um, but it was a drag cause it's in, at 60 years old, I know if I, you know, if you could turn back time, that's a share song, isn't it? Yeah. Um, I wish there were, there were producers at the time. I wish they would have taken him I wish, you know, just taken him like, Hey, let's do the music thing or the, you know, the smooth jazz thing. Let's create something here. Right. You know, cause he could play like a mother. Yeah. You know, he was phenomenal and he had such, you know. And his dexterity at age 60 was better than oh, it yeah. ever had been. Yeah. Wow. Yeah, it was weird. Um, and, you know, the other, his, oh, the other his voice, his playing voice. Yeah, exactly. Was more seasoned. Yeah. More, he just had more He to knew say. when to come in and when to go out. There, um, I recently found out when making this film, when he played with Ray Charles, there's a song that he plays and I put it at the end of the film. It's called, um, it's the Kermit song. It's not right. easy being it's green. Not yeah. easy being green, yeah. And it's Ray Charles playing, uh, you know, singing and my father playing behind him. And I only recently found out how that came about was Ray's there, obviously, and he's playing and my father starts on his own to come in. He's not doing, he's not doing what he's supposed to be doing. Uh huh. But Ray goes, Hey, what's that? That sounds great. Keep it going. Yeah. My father knows when to go in and come out. Right. If he, you know, he knows he's seasoned enough to take that chance. What's he going to do? Say no. So he doesn't, he won't do it. Right. But he knew to take a chance and see what, and that whole section was supposed to be a string section. Instead, it became an acoustic guitar section. Wow. You know what I mean? So he created something there on his own. Wow. That is something. And that's not a voice a 20 year old has. No. You've got to Because that guy that's 20 might not know to try that. Or right. might not feel that, like, might be too scared to do it. Right. It's right. Yeah. It's you know what I mean? It's, it's, like, yeah. it's like actors working with, when you work with actors and comedians or um, when I work with them, you could see the guys that go, oh, that's why he's that. 
Right. Like a Steve Carell or a Steve Colbert. And there's another guy I worked with named Paul Greenberg. And I remember him, we were doing some promos for um comedy uh, game show network. And it was like, this guy was like, he just kept coming at us with, you know, improv. Blah, 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 you know, just kept never stopping. It was then became a challenge for this guy to keep it going. You know what I mean? And that's where you go, these guys have it. Right. And have polished it. Because mm-hmm. the thing is, that's Ray Charles. Yeah. yeah. You know, he's been at it so long and he's got, he's so tuned into something that he's been focused on for all of those years. And then here comes your dad, who really is one of the few people on the planet who was his peer. Yeah, right. Who could step in yeah. with, the, <clears throat> with the courtesy yeah. of that. They have, they that have mutual respect for each other. Right. right. There was a great story at that, se- it must have been that session. It was a cash date, so it wasn't a contract, union contract. So it was cash date, and at the end, my father goes to get his, you know, cash, whatever it was, might have, let's say, five hundred dollars or whatever. And Ray goes, "What?" And he said, "Ray, you said it was cash." Yeah, but I don't have that money. He said, "What am I going to give to the robbers if they rob me?" <laughs> like he was like fifty dollars <laughs> short or something. He said, "All right, fine, keep the fifty. Give him something or something." It was like, "Oh my god!" Wow. It's just so funny. That's incredible, too, to, to be able. So Ray has something in his head that he wants. Your dad's able to come in in a musical conversation and show him instantly. And Ray knows what, what's crap and what's not crap. Right. He goes, right. ooh, that's, that's Well, the great example John Williams said, he was honoring my father. And John Williams had it, said it. He said, listen, as composers, we write something. And we only can hope that we will get 70, 80% of what we wrote on tape but then there's guys like tommy and these guys that come in and give you 110 percent right. because what they're doing is they're looking at the music they're feeling they're understanding it and they're going to give more than you know again it's experience it takes seasoned professionals to do that they're they're out there you just but that's why there's so few of them because they're the guys you go to right sure you know um when he used to talk about you know, uh, my father used to do these seminars and he would do these like pieces of, um, he would show, okay, here's a John Williams piece. Someone would say, well, the other thing was, I'm all over the place now. Someone would say, what would he want to be remembered for? It would probably be his film work because when he's working with a John Williams or James Horner or, <clears throat> excuse me, a Henry Mancini or Goldsmith, when James Horner or they're calling him say, keep two weeks in the month of April, the first month of, you know, two weeks of April open because I got this film and it's going to be guitar driven. You know when you made it because, you know, that's six months or four months, whatever it is, he's calling you out Say, don't take work those two weeks right? because he's writing for you. I need you. And they know what he needs. There's right. a film he needs that work. And that that's, is driven by the guitar. Exactly. And I know exactly <clears throat> yeah. whose guitar we need. Yeah, exactly. This is one of those things where they have the checkbook to go get Anyone. exactly what they want. Exactly. You're right. I never thought of it like that. And the thing is, listen, all the rock dates he did with our Beach Boys or Marquettes or whatever those songs were, anybody could have done that. Do you know what I mean? There's There were 10, 12 guitar players that could have done that, but there's only one Tommy Tedesco that did that thing with John Williams that yeah. day. And he, maybe there's one other guy in town at that point. But they want him, and that's very special in your life. And they want those last 30%. Yes, Because you know, exactly. he's got it, you know? There was a great line um, that when James Horner did uh, Cocoon, and he then he did Cocoon 2. And when my father went back to do the music con- Cocoon 2, did I say that right? Cocoon 2? It was written... It sounds like an African film. It does. Cocoon. <laughs> Uh, so he did that, but when the music was written the second time for the second movie, it, he, my father could tell was written for him because he wrote these, whatever these triplets, I don't know how musically, yeah. but he wrote these things that my father does on his own. Right. So he, he wrote them in. He, he, he knew James he wrote them in because he wanted him to do that thing that you do, you know, do that thing that you do, but right. he wrote them in. Right. And wow. that's pretty cool. That is, that's really cool. That's the ultimate compliment. Yeah, you yeah. know, artistically speaking. I mean, uh, uh, it's like here's where Chevy Chase falls in yeah, my movie. Right, exactly. Yeah. You're talking elite yeah. peers, and they know what you do, and they need it. So, like, we want you to. This is you. Go yeah. ahead and do you. You know. Yeah. yeah. That's incredible. So yeah. let's talk about 
Now, uh, this is what I appreciate about you sitting down with us tonight. You don't have any more promoting to do. Oh, no, I do. I do. Yeah. I mean, the film. Wishful yeah, thinking. Uh, yeah. Well, I mean, listen, here's Magnolia picked it up, and I'm thrilled for that because they've, you know, they seem to be, everybody says, when I mean, you talk to certain, even theaters, you talk mm-hmm. to theaters, say, what do you think of Magnolia Pictures? They have high regards. They do some great films. They release a lot of great films, and they seem very honest, which is great. Um, but my concern is I can't let my guard down. And I know my wife's saying, you're going to have to give it up. I said, I understand that, but I still have to make those phone calls. I still have to make sure that, you know, we give, I, I give my best shot at it because this is it. And case. you are still the face of the film. I am still the face of the film. And I, at the end, I can only try to make the most of every screening. My feeling is like, okay, you know what? What if we do that one phone call or that one interview? You know, that brought in five more people. Those five people turn around, it multiplies. Right. They'll, you know, like today, right, we have, what, 30 people in the today's screening, the afternoon. All right, not much, but you know, those 30 people will tell people. Yeah. Um, you got 30 enthusiastic people. In exactly. Screening. Yeah. I mean, they, they don't walk out of here. No one walks out, do they? You've seen a few times. Yeah. If people walk out, go, oh my God. Yeah. It's excellent. No, there's no it's apathy. A, the greatest compliment, there was so great, is when you get someone's, usually as a musician's wife or girlfriend that's been dragged to this thing. Right. You know, it's like, you right. know, they don't want to be here. Not your audience. It's yeah. not my audience. It's like a music like, dog. I'm the easy win. I, I yeah, brought you're right. Pete. <laughs> right. You guys are easy. <laughs> But it's like someone that's going to come in and is like, oh, God, I'm going to support my mate. All right. I'm going to go. It's a music doc. Great. And they come up to me and go, I did not want to come here. And I'm so glad I did. Wow. That's the greatest compliment. Because it's not about the music. Like the other line I said, you know, you had the bones. The other line was when Plaz Johnson, I said, what is it like? You guys, how did it affect your personal lives? You were gone all the time. You were working all around the clock, sometimes midnight sessions. And he paused. He says, I'm a better grandfather than I was a father. Yeah. Now, again, you know it as a father. You know as a father. You know what it takes. What are you guys doing tonight? Where's your kids tonight? Yeah, we're hustling. You yeah. know what I mean? Yeah. You, you're, you know, we all know we give up something when we do our job. Right. And we have to decide. And I, this, this film has taken a toll on me, in a sense. And I didn't know sometimes where to pull back. But I always felt like I got to get this thing out. And I know there's moments where you go, you know what? Maybe I shouldn't have been here this weekend. Yeah. You know, maybe I should have stayed home this, but you know. Yeah, but I could adjust. I could adjust. But you know, you could just go with it. And that's the thing is like, we all do. You don't, you could be a carpenter. You could be a plumber. You could be the postman. Well, maybe the postman goes home every day. He knows. Yeah. But you know what I mean? We all, we're in all that situation right now. Yep. You know. but you Tell us how old your kids are. 15, she'll be 16, and I have a nine-year-old. 16 and nine. So the, the reality is that they only know all dad, your kids All know. they know is daddy does wrecking crew. And they, right. Wow. You know, that's the, they got to realize daddy does other things too. Yeah. You know what they're also going to realize though? And, and I hope you realize this too. You are a man of destiny. To truly find your destiny, to figure out what it was that you were meant to do, is an incredible thing. You know, and, and uh-huh. this really, this is... It's a career long thing you've done right here. Well, that's a problem. <laughs> that is a problem. <laughs> no, it is not. Yes, or not. It is. Uh, it is, it well, is absolutely fantastic. I, well, I appreciate that. I mean, listen, I I laugh because you know what I was saying earlier in that audience. Like, I wanted to be a writer. Yeah, I wasn't a writer because I'm no more of a writer than I was ever going to be a musician. You know, more of a writer than a musician because I didn't practice. A writer writes every day. Yeah. Right. Someone that does something does it every, every day. day. It makes it. What well, someone said, I read somewhere, was it 10,000 hours to be something? That's right. Is yeah. What is it? Malcolm Gladwell there. Right? Is that yeah. what it is? Right. Yeah. 10,000 hours. To achieve something. mastery. Yeah. Well, I feel I did that on this film. Yep. No oh, kidding. And I, as I said to someone, I said, if I had done 50% practicing a guitar, I would be a hell of a guitar player. And But as my friend said, yeah, but you'd be out of work like the rest of us. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> So that's true, man. But, you know, but there's but, only one thing I can think of that I do every day, and nobody's going to pay me for that. <laughs> <laughs> well, I'd be a rich man. <laughs> <laughs> I'm hoping we're talking about the same thing. <laughs> there was it Father Sarducci? I think we had a joke about that, like a nickel every time you masturbated or something. Yeah, he got. <laughs> Here's a great joke. I love, I love Father. You're leave us without, a, endi, pun- leave us without a punchline yeah, on that yeah, one. No, you don't need a punchline. You just like, you got, 
Everybody, everybody <laughs> listening to this podcast, just imagine the mountain of nickels. <laughs> I can't remember the joke. I just remember the payoff. Was, yeah. you know what? Father Guido <laughs> Sarducci is part of the joke. I mean, it's it, what a character. It was basically seeing he gets to St. Peter or something. Like, and, and, <laughs> and you were, you know, he had so much money to start with, and well, he, but they took away. All right. All right we're going to have to look that up. That's yeah. worth looking up. Um, what were you talking but about? But you, it, well, I was, well, I, you know, the thing, yes, you're right about the, the destiny, the destiny or whatever. I hope it's a destiny. And the biggest, you know, the concern sometimes people said, you know what? There was a couple, you know, filmmakers or filmmakers, people out there that would say, Hey man, congrats. You did it. I said, I didn't do shit. I haven't done anything. This is years ago. No, but you finished it. You did really. I said, like, well, great. But you know what? It doesn't mean shit if I just finished it. Big deal. I got to get this thing out there. Yeah. And my biggest problem was I put everything into this. When I say I did all the things you're not supposed to do. Everything. Everything. I yeah. did flipping credit cards. Yeah. And I'm doing another one this week. I'm going, oh, God. I hope this one works. Yeah. You know, doing the the financing, the mortgage and this and that, borrowing. and Because you cross a line. You go, well, what do I do? Yeah. Right. If I don't finish it. Yeah. If I don't go to the finish line, we have nothing. All yeah. in is all in. Yeah, right. It, it no longer matters. This no, and that's happen. the thing. It's right. a big deal. I, you know, made a film, went really well and into the into the film festivals and did all this. Well, guess what? I could walk away with all the awards. What's that do me? doesn't mm-hmm. do me shit. Yeah. yeah. So now I got to the point where I have to show this has legs. Yeah. And that's where I'm more proud of is the fact that, you know what? You know, all those people that said, you know, it would never sell because it was too niche. Well, guess what? Watch. I've seen this film play around the world. Yeah. I've seen it and play. And you've seen in, the reactions. You've seen been in all the niches. emotions. I've done everything. And yeah. the thing is, I go to these cities, you know, from Athens, Georgia, to Barcelona, Spain, to, uh, you know, Bellingham, Washington. I see the same reaction. Israel. It's just, a di- it may be a different audience, but they all know the music. Right. It, this is America's greatest export. Yeah, you know, and I heard you telling some folks out, outside that England knows our music better than we do. They do, and we see that all the time. I mean, they all just the are students of the music that we take for granted. Right. I mean, I when I was living in England, I was uh, early '80s, and I remember going to a, a club. You know, those it was called the Hacienda. It was a very famous club in Manchester, and <clears throat> he actually made a movie of it. And the club was, I mean, filled with punkers. You know, it was just filled with all that, you know, just drugs and punks and everything else. And we were, it was a good time and bad time. It was the worst of England at the, you know, we were really having a tough time. Then he knows where to find the party. Yeah, I did. This is what I'm finding. But, um, but what was interesting is the song at the time was a Nina Simone song. Wow. And it was like from the 60s, but they were playing it as if it's the first time they heard it. Yeah. And it's in the club. Wow. In the club. And I'm going, there's no way this could ever play at this home. This is a time warp. Yeah. This is no way they could have played this in a, a club in Los Angeles or New York, or, you know, with our our age group at that time. Right? Yeah. And, so, and they, when I went back recently, the DJs are using, you know, 45s. We, you know, they'd be going to clubs and be using, you know, 45, uh, you know, and LPs and stuff. And they're playing stuff from like B size of stuff like Dave Axelrod and all these things from Capitol Records that no one here knows. Wow. You know, Lee Hazelwood's king over there. Huh. You know, the, the stuff from, uh, you know, so America is spoiled. We do, you know, we don't. I don't think look inside too much. Yeah, and appreciate what we got as well yeah. as everybody else. So. We drive forward a lot too, where we just go right by things that are truly gems, you know. And yeah, and, and we're lucky. Yeah, I mean, you're right. We have the great. We do have some of the greatest talent and some of the greatest opportunities and this and that. And you know, um, I I just you know it's. I think that's what the thing is. Someone said, "Why why should you know these." You know, it's discouraging. It's really encouraging. Let's go to the positive. It's really encouraging when I see someone. I remember in Rochester, New York, this kid came. He was 15 years old. He was the first in line. And I went, where's your parents? You know, waiting for his parents. He said, yeah. I came alone. I came like, alone. Oh, my God. This is like Rochester, New York. I said, well, how do you know about this? He was a student. 
he heard, he knew all about it. He studied, you know, he was into it. And the same thing is, like I say, if you're into painting, if you're, in, you got to know Monet and Picasso and, you know, Michelangelo, you got to know all the artists. Well, this is a time period that is special, will never come back. Very special. Yep. Right. You know, because this is when those guys needed to be there because the other guys couldn't do it. And it wasn't until the late 60s when bands could play their own stuff. You know, you had Led Zeppelin, you had these groups doing their, you know, Crosby, Stills, and Nash doing their own stuff. Well, it swayed to the older bands, too. I mean, you know, Crosby, Stills, and Nash, Buffalo, Springfield. and Right. Those guys were older, and there was a time, and, you know, when we watched all of the acts that were in the Wrecking Crew, they were young acts. And that was a, right. a time for youthful music where the voices were youthful and they still had to be efficient and effective in the studio. And that, it's, it's a new way to doing it, but that still exists, like with boy bands and, and yeah. the, the packaged artists that they have. Oh, they're, yeah, not, absolutely. they're not doing the musical part of it. They're doing the performance piece of it. So it still exists. It's just they don't have your dad in a room. Yeah, it just exists a little differently it's now. On a yeah. computer and there's yeah, one dude doing well, it. Well that was that was the other thing we talked about in the Q and A tonight. You know, people realize how music was done then. They had to be in the room together. Right. Now you don't have to be in the room together. Right. And unfortunately what happens is those people don't influence each other. They don't there's a collaboration yeah. dynamic. When you that grow goes up away. playing when you grow up playing drums, you play with people. Right. Right. You yeah. know, maybe you didn't, but I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> just because I mean, there's just, certain things we don't do with people. Okay. Well I mean if you do it every day, you practice every day by yourself. <laughs> I don't know what you're doing. Right. But but it's true. Yeah. That you know I mean? goes away. Because now you're playing against you're playing in the computer, you're playing the tracks. I mean, how many kids probably don't even they could go to music school and never play with anybody before. Yeah, right. it is it is the musical equivalent of masturbation, and, and then that, yeah. that takes away from your dad's thirty you percent. How about jazz? <laughs> no, <laughs> <laughs> that takes away from your dad's thirty percent that he could give because he and his peers can't be in the same room. Expanding that envelope, the envelope yeah. is set. This is the package right here. Please fill in this your portion of the package. Yeah, it's funny because I talked to you know session players. My brother's a, a engineer. He does orchestras and all that stuff. And I'll say, who was the guitar player in the, in the orchestra? He said there was none. And he says, they'll, sometimes they'll just bring them in alone now. You know, sometimes the guitar players nowadays they don't even see anybody. Right. They're just doing an overdub. You know, it's really interesting. And that's with orchestras. Right. You know, so it's just really, you know, you don't have that feeling of... Um, it's one of the things that's changed that has a, you know, there's a sadness about the the lessening, the diminishing of the collaboration. I mean, yeah. the things change and some things get better. And as some things get better, you leave some things... You, well, it's like back behind. to Hollywood. You know, when I was there, it was horrible. Yeah. In the 40s, it was awesome. Yeah. You know, I think it's pretty cool now again. Yeah. You know, I'm hoping that music is the same way. And I think music, listen, we talked about that earlier. I'm not a musician, but, you know, people always can gripe. Ah, oh, they don't make music like they used to. You know what? That's bullshit. Music is bullshit. That's bullshit. Because yeah. music is music. It's just you got to get through a lot of crap to yeah. see. And it's no different then. There was a lot of crap in the 60s right. and well, 70s and yes. 80s. And don't say there wasn't. No, there was. Because we, could make, a, well, we the could, make about, the, we could make that compilation. Oh, man. That's true. And the thing about where your dad was, was back then there, there were gatekeepers. And there's good and bad to being to having gatekeepers. The good is, well, if you get through the gatekeepers, you got to be pretty darn good. Yeah. So the... The stuff that you could go into a record store and buy had to have achieved some level of quality. Right, right. Well, we think, yeah. Well, uh, but well, nowadays also, everybody has a home studio, well, so there's exactly. a whole glut of shit you have to dig through before you get to something right. that's, you know, that's good. And that doesn't mean there's not good stuff. No, no, I think there is good stuff. I just, and we were saying that, it's like, like I said, in 1965, when I'm growing up, and my dad's doing all that stuff. Yeah. If we're as kids, we're listening. If you went back fifty years to nineteen fifteen, what are we listening to? The, I, the earliest thing I remember listening to as kids, my parents' music was the big bands. Yeah, sure. All right, so that's thirties and forties. Right. There's really not not much me. before that. No. Techno the, and technology. Now yeah. those poor our kids. Your kids seventeen. Right. My kids sixteen. 
they have all of our stuff and more right. and their stuff. And, and you don't have to be proficient at a guitar to play it and make music. You no. can now make music with the computer, not yeah. touch an instrument. Yeah. And uh, and you're right about that music from 1915. Name something. As, what was it? Ragtime. What was the music of that era? Yeah. Go back 50 years further back. Music is different. Always has been. Always yeah. will be. And it'll continue to be consumed in some. You way. know, it's I, just a matter of trying to find what is. Oh my God! There's there is a Lennon, John Lennon. There is a John Williams or a Paul McCartney. There are brilliant musicians out there. Right. We there's just so much content. Yep. There's almost I heard impossible. recently that it takes us now two weeks to create the amount of content that existed between the dawn of time and 1974. Yeah. Wow. It that's takes amazing. us two weeks now. Wait a minute. Wait a minute. Say that. To create that. that. So if you that. capture all of the intellectual material that was created right. between the beginning of humanity right. and 1974. It, 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 now, every two weeks now, we have that much. Every two weeks. It's funny because I remember the uh, someone said it would t- it, uh, the New York Times was as much information, Sunday New York Times, as something that I get in the 1400s. Sure. And, you know, in terms of knowledge and stuff. And it, it's really extraordinary. And like you said, that's crazy. Let's talk for a minute about your what you've done to promote the film raise money because I had to come up with ideas you've been on the hustle yeah yeah i had to come up i mean there was a point where it's like like i said earlier no one was going to touch this film no one was going to touch it because it was going to cost them money to make money and they could not do it because there was so much if you're going to spend seven hundred fifty thousand dollars on a, on the music or whatever let's say five hundred thousand right it's a documentary that means they're going to have to put another two fifty, three hundred. Who knows how much more? Sure. Let's bring it up to a million now. No documentary, very few documentaries ever make a million dollars. That's the fact. I mean, it's a small minority. So they are already you're going against everything already. You're swimming upstream. You exactly. So it's going to take a long time. So that's the only way. Was the only way was I'm going to have to pay all this off. So we would do is we did like the donations, five dollars, whatever. Everybody jumped in. And then we started doing um, screenings. I would go to local screenings. I would four wallet, rent a place. Hey, let me show you this. I would get donations, whatever, sell tickets. Um, But then I was doing is I would go to a town anywhere. It could be Washington and say, listen, I'll go to a music store. I'll go wherever. I'll give you 10 tickets for 500 bucks. Put your name up on the screen before your name's up on the DVD, da, 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 da. And, you know, you use those 10 tickets to, you know, to your clients. So that started working. That money on sponsorship money helped us pay for the travel. So that was really working well. Um, and then, you know, then the tickets, you know, would start paying off the licensing. And that's how we kept going. Um, is this working? Yeah. Okay. So I've seen that, though, I've seen it work really well. Yeah. And we had an event in Benicia that you that, that was our really, favorite. That was our really f- knocked out. John, John was there. I think. Oh, that, that this thing is my awesome. favorite. This is where stupidity and genius works together or it doesn't work. I don't know what you want to call it. So my sister says, Hey, I really want to show the screening. I don't really want to have a screening up here with the film. I said, all right. I said, Dad, and she goes, well, let's do it at the high school. I said, well, if we do it at the high school, let's do it for the high school. You know what I mean? Let's do it for the band. And she says, all right. So they have a beautiful theater there. It's like 400 seater, yeah, beautiful nice. room, auditorium. So I said, well, let's do it there. So she goes to the band and she goes, you know, she wants to do this. And I said, and I said to my sister, I said, here's the thing though, is I'm tired. I said, I have a, we do have an audience and well, I will promote the shit out of this thing. Right. But let them, if there's a, whatever, 60 kids, let them all sell two tickets each. That's 120. It's a third of or a quarter of what we need to fill the place. We'll do the rest. Right. And the band turns it down. Wow. You know what? Let me just interject because yeah. my son goes to that high school. And I don't know what the hell the band was thinking. I'm, I love school music. I love school mu- I was a band nerd right. myself. So I want the band to succeed. All right. We all do. And I'm I, all for it. Hey, listen. I was in the... I'm sorry. I wasn't in the band. I was a banner carrier. But that's but another story. Go on. <laughs> well, what I'm saying is my son is a baseball player. Right. And when he gets 10 tickets, 
they say, here's your 10 tickets. We could give a shit what you do with them. Give us our 500 bucks. Okay. And I didn't know a, that. And to a player, every one of us goes, well, here I go. And we'll go sell the tickets. It's all in Roca. That's what we did. Do whatever, you know, whatever it is. But the first thing yeah. is we're giving you 10 tickets and we need to check for 500 bucks. Right. And, and I, that, I mean, that's not necessarily the dollar amount. Maybe it's 200 yeah. bucks. Right. But here's the 10 tickets. Right. And these guess tickets, what? You sold them. And guess yeah. what? These tickets were $20. Right. Yeah. And the thing, and so when she got turned down, and they said, well, we can't ask our band members to do that because we have so much on it. I'm we calling have, bullshit. We have, because, we have, like I said, my son goes yeah. to that school. And every one of those activities says, here's your 10 tickets. Well, and Thank you it very was, much. It, it, this sounds like a bitch session, which is nice. Yeah. Um, but, it, but it was like, <laughs> well, yeah, you know, it's like, all right, fine. All right. Yeah. So then my sister, so God bless band, her. God damn it. I'm pissed off about this, Good. Danny. I am pissed. Because well, we went through the. I was on the phone with your sister and I said, Oh, that's so right. You were you part of that. I was. And I said, Did you talk to the band director? And she said, Yeah. He said, No. And I said, What in the fuck? He said, No. <laughs> this I, is a movie about music. Yeah. It's about. It's so, so then I. So she comes back and she says, I'm going to ask the cheerleader squad. I said, Go for it. Yeah. Yeah. Someone wants turn, to turn, so then we this guess is who awesome. makes things happen at that. So school. the cheerleaders, all of a sudden, we have a cheerleading squad outside, oh, welcoming people. Right. So when we cheers. walked into the lobby, Pete, yeah. we were surrounded by cheerleaders. It's hilarious. It There's, was awesome. And they're and they're they're doing a rock and robin. They're doing cheers to wrecking crew songs. That's fantastic. And, and this is the thing that the band could have done. They could have played some songs. They could have had the you know jazz what? band right. open up and do a set. Before the film, they could I, have I had... hate I hate to be bad mouthing this, but in the end, yeah. the cheerleaders made four thousand well, dollars. That, that's a lot of pom poms. That is a lot of pom poms, that was, or but, a lot of drumsticks, or a lot of right. reeds for a whatever. But that's the kind of thing is like what I've been trying to do is involve. If sure. I can share, it's great. Yeah, helps me. It helps them, and and the thing is, is like I want to involve. The greatest thing is involving people. When I go to different cities, I've met so many cool people because this music's touched so many cool, you know, it's really yeah, cool people. It's, it's part of our lives. It is yeah. a thing that connects any of us. I mean, we can go out into the parking lot after the screening and meet 20 strangers right. and we all know each other. Did you know, um, did, I don't know if we said it, this news, uh, this newscast, hello newscast. By the way, your film is playing outside. We're in the dressing room. And your film is playing outside. Do we know where we are? No. Did you? We're at Solano Community College. They... Where, where are we at in the film, I think. Yeah. Talking about. But oh, I know I'm where sorry. we are at Solano College. Yes. This is where we are. Okay. But um, the uh, film is playing outside, and I just hollered, God damn it, I'm fucking pissed, and this is bullshit, or whatever. So I well, hope that Hold didn't. on. Let's be quiet for a second. Let me hear where we are in the film. Okay. I think we're okay. All right. <laughs> I think we get 10 do, more minutes. Do you know the film well enough I to think hear I, where yeah, we are? I kind of okay. heard intonation. <laughs> just making sure. So the, the best thing, we were talking about the dedications of the songs, right? Right. Yeah. All right, so people would dedicate songs in, to their loved ones, to their parents, or, or the, you know, whatever. It was yeah. Be My Baby, all these beautiful songs. So the one song, there were two, recently this one song, I said, oh, no one's dedicated Gary Lewis and the Playboys. I went, you know, doing the Everybody Loves a Clown. I right. thought, I'm running out of time because I'm thinking, this film's going to come out and no one's dedicated that song. I'm thinking, and I would go through these songs and go, hmm. Well, there's only one place to go, clown school. Right. <laughs> so I literally cold called a clown school and I sent the guy a note and I said, listen. And he goes, this is an awesome pitch. I love it. And he yeah. gave. And the greatest wow. thing is I was so thrilled about that because A, is so funny. Yeah. But it's so true. It's so true. You know, and his, his, uh, his uh, what do you call it, dedication was everybody loves a clown. Or no, everybody, lo everybody is a clown. Everybody Not everybody a clown. loves a clown. Everybody is Everybody a clown. Everybody is a clown. clown. Okay. And wow. It, it's true. You know, it, it's just funny thinking outside the box. You know, I did this with uh, CDs before we did this. My brother and I had a compilation company. We do uh, promotional CDs. You know, give away CDs. I'll put your name on this thing. I mean, I like marketing. I like trying to figure out how to... S I don't like selling. Right. That's someone else that could do that. It's funny that you say that because you've had to do a sales job. On this film for the last, I'm not, years. I guess I'm not that good then. You've had to <laughs> do a sales job. years. <laughs> Some, <laughs> someone said, "Man, you really made a great film." Yeah, you take 18 years, you better. Wow. Yeah. 
But it is man, great you fun, really though. put this into perspective. We're I am. I'm such a. I'm about, such like, a. I know. I'm such a downer. Awesome. Yeah, I'm such it's 18 a, years, man. No, but I mean, listen. I, I'm glad I did it the way. You know, I look at it and go, I'm very proud, and I'm very proud of when I see cuts and go, my God, my editor, she did such a great job. Yeah. Well, it's tough uh, to follow in the footsteps of a guy like Tommy Tedesco. I mean, your dad was a legend. He was a great. And when you grow up, and you don't really. You know, see that you see dad and he goes to work, yeah. and then you find that out through the making of this film. But I think what you've done now is you've created in your legacy the perpetuation of the great story of a tremendous number of guys and yeah. and, and one lady. Yeah. And uh, you know, you've you've pre- preserved that story, but I mean, really, we only need to look and and in 18 years of doing it, and of course, this is a this is a time capsule picture. I mean, this is going to go yeah. in the archives, and and uh, well, I'm very I'm very thrilled and uh, very lucky. I was the one that did it. I mean, lucky I was in the right place at the right time, but I was the only one that did it. Yeah. And when I got these guys, you know, Glenn Campbell, I nobody kinda, else could have done it though. No, and, and, the, and you someone do might it. have done, but they would not have. Not not with the perspective no. that you And you no. couldn't have got them now. It's no. over. No. As, as I said earlier, I said, you know, if well, God bless Glenn, he, yeah. you can never get Glenn now. And when I got Glenn, there was a problem. Wow. That was 12, 14 years ago whenever I did him. Yeah. And I knew there was something going on there. And same thing with um, the rest Brian. of them. Brian is Brian. Yeah. But, you know, all the rest of them was like, you go, you ask someone a question now, they're 84. It's different. You know what it's like at 84 versus 64. Right, right. You know. Yeah. You Never know. mind if there's an illness or anything. It's, it's just, just the, pers- a, the being at 84. Yeah. I mean, look at me. I'm 53. And when I started yeah. this, I was 36. I was a lot. Yeah. Well, ask me about, My God, you already look like Ask shit. me about something from 20 years ago. It's going to be tough to no, remember all right. of those things. Right. You know, it just. And so, that's where the thing is. And you're with, 27. I yeah. know. I'm 27. Well, think about those. That's the thing with these people. It's like, you know, someone said, well, they, they, you know, these guys went to work every day for 10. Let's say my dad was working constantly every day from 61 to into the 80s. But he was doing more than one job a day. He's doing right. two, three, four days of dates a day. Yes. So they, and the other thing is they don't know what they're doing because they're recording songs. They're not recording hits. Right. Because they don't know it's a hit until a year later. Right. Oh, I, I love the line in the film that, that, you know, it's some people would view the injustice. Like your dad played on so many hit records. Yeah. But you know what? Guess what? He played on 35,000 people's records that weren't a hit. Yeah. Well, that's what he said. He said, listen, he, he says, paid for all of those. Yeah. He said, that was his thing. Just, yeah. People would say, shouldn't you have gotten more money You know, for, let's say, putting your input? And he says, no. He says, I made hundreds of hits, but I made thousands of bombs. Yeah. Now, I never gave back his $25, anybody his $25. Right. It's just what we did. It's exactly and right. And someone said, well, you know, should he get paid more? And I said, no. What are you going to do? Is like the doctor giving a diagnosis? Yeah. Well, you know, I think just it, for right another $35, $35, I'll give you a little more information. No, you, you, you're, you're an artist. You give whatever you, you give your what job. You have, yeah. It's like the old job, the old um, adage is, you got this job. You got to yeah. get the next job. Well, what's going to get you the next job is giving your best on this job. Right. Yep. So you're going to give that extra. And he got to ask for a premium price. Yeah. Because he he did absolutely. Give you that extra. Yeah. So you know they these guys were double scale, triple scale at times when they could get it. So it's what it yeah. was. So really, what is what is next for Danny Tedesco? Denny Tedesco said, take this as long as he can just to, you know, to get it out there. Yeah. I'm going to get this thing, make sure that Magnolia gets my support, mm-hmm. you know, and um, I want to make sure that the music magazines do it. I want to make sure the real you know, public gets to hear it. I want it out there, and then I want to Yeah, move the world on. needs to see it. Yeah. You know, um, man, I'm going to admit, I'm not, and I'm not bullshitting for the, for the microphone. Uh, I've seen this film four times, mm-hmm. and I cried four times. That's amazing. Yeah, yeah. It's it's a powerful movie, and really seriously, from from me to you, thank you for making it. I thank you because you you took us to to Rock and Roll Olympus and showed us around back where where the musicians were yeah, and you pulled uh, the curtain back. Yeah, yeah. man, and we. Lo- yeah, that's, yeah, but we you know that. what's really cool is they're not that different than any of us. Yeah. No, of course not. Do yeah. you know what I mean? And that's right. the greatest thing. And that was thing. the thing was the humanity of the picture yeah. because we, we're all marveling at, wow, all these great songs yeah. and all this no different part, part of popular culture but the part that 
you know, the part that, that gets you emotionally, that gets me emotionally about the film was, you know, when your shots with your dad at the end. Or yeah. And I'm glad also, by the way, that you put yourself in the movie. Yeah. Oh, right, which wasn't supposed to be. Right. Yeah. But the, sure. um, who is walking away with Everybody the wants that. It's my dad. That is your dad. That, that's the video I did. Nice. That's the video. To come back to that video in 1986, wow. that's the video of my dad. It's called Impressions of Hollywood Boulevard. That's Hollywood and Vine. That's the store that's below my my loft. Nice. It was closed. What an image. Right? And so I, and it was like at 530 in the morning. We you know had the TV in the, in the, in the, in the window. In the window, yeah. We played back the footage we shot. A couple days before, or whatever. So we pull back and watch him look at it and walk away. People always go, "So who's that?" And yeah, they always, who'd you put the hat yeah, on? Yeah, exactly. It's like, no, that's him. It that was, was just him. the other great part is, which was an accident, not an accident. It just came years later. Was El- uh, Elvis? Hello, uh, Zappa. Yeah. Oh, man, People say well, now Zappa came from an interview in 1983 of a doc we were doing for college. Never went anywhere. Did nothing. Went to Zappa's house to talk about dad. And, and he said, and we were showing him the gong show stuff, and he came back with his, and I thought Zappa was going to be funny. Zappa's not funny. That's sure, not his he's thing. A deep, he's a deep, deep dude. dude. Yeah. You know, his, he's iconic or ironic or whatever you want to call it. It's like, eh. But when he said these words, I'm like, well, that didn't really help me. 30 years that, later. That wasn't what you were going for. No, but 30 years later, nailed what he it. said nailed it. It's yeah. as if Zappa says, you know what? I won't be here in 30 years. Here, you take this and just hold on to this piece of, yeah. piece of you know. Because he's that deep. Right. And yeah. you're thinking, oh, man, you asshole. And he's yeah. saying, you're welcome. Yeah. yeah. And totally. I mean, it's, and it's like, because he's talking about, you know, for those, well, they'll see it when they see the film, but he's talking about what the business was like. Yeah. You know, Tommy doing it, so. Is, are we, I think I gotta go do a Q&A yeah, I think you gotta do it getting it's, close Hey thanks a lot Thanks man. guys hey, Thank you for everything It was awesome We'd love to have you on the show again Alright we'll thank do you. it when uh, When the film comes out Sounds good Beautiful. Okay Awesome <laughs>